wonder whether it, that is the premonition of the things to come in the 21st century America. California, especially Los Angeles, is a gateway to both Asia and Latin America, poses a universal question of coming century, how deal with the other, it's capital O, says Carlos Fuentes. But it is in every American's interest, and certainly in immigrant and, and people of color's communities' interest, that we do not enter the new century at each other's throat. When asked whether California, especially the multi-ethnic society, represented in the America of the 21st century, Alice Walker replied, if that's not the future reality of the United States, there won't be any United States because that's who you are. Thank you. Take a break, but instead of 10 minutes, let's just take five minutes um, and keep thinking multi ethnic America, multi ethnic coalition, so we don't lose some of this energy and the thoughts that's um, growing in your heads, hopefully. So please go for five minutes and let's all come in here because the real meat of the discussion is really during the question and answer and the, the comment period. Thank you. Response that you might have, and also any additional points. 
um, let me just recap very briefly. Our speakers really um, covered so many things. They, they have uh, talked about the global economic trends, the, the unstoppable tide that is uh, pushing international migrants into um, uh, the Western countries uh, from the third world, and also related structural changes, um, uh, related to some of the, the information, the, the transformation of our information system and emergence of information access to information and uh, technical education as um, a new area or, or an, uh, an emphasized area of struggle. The importance for uh, studying the histories of um, uh, our communities. Um, and we talked about also revitalizing or how to work with our nation's institutions so that uh, they are strengthened and uh, our democracy is strengthened and is able to handle this profound demographic and economic and social changes. Um, those are just some of the points. It's, it's, not, it's not an organized list, so please feel free to come up. There's a microphone uh, in the middle, um, and you may either direct your question to all the panelists or a specific panelist. Um, so, anyone? Um, is the mic on? No, you don't need the mic. <laughs> uh, actually, it's not a question, it's a concern. Uh, I've been to many conferences and dealing with the question of the immigration situation. And what I go away from most of them is the frustration because they're dealing mainly with the issue of the legal immigrant. I'm concerned about the real, the victims, and those who are going to be guillotined in a symbolic way at the end of this month, the so-called illegal immigrant. And I just feel there's just not enough attention to dealing with that issue. Now, the, 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 I'm very excited by the panel's discussions, and I, I get a feeling that certainly efforts will be made to coalesce the different ethnic groups around the issue of immigration. But there are others. I've attended several meetings with groups of priests and other persons connected with the three Catholic dioceses in this area, Long Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Archdiocese. And there's such panic, there's such pain listening to the stories that I've heard there, but there's been no solutions. And they talk the same language I heard here. How do we build broad coalitions, one with our parishioners and with others? And I wondered if something could be done, and I, I certainly can bring the personnel involved here in touch with some of these clergy who are working on that end. And then there's another group. I come out of the labor movement, and I'll tell you, the labor movement is part of the problem, has been part of the problem, but it's now the victim because the sweatshops could not exist today without the fear, justified fear, uh, it would, uh, the immigration community were being exploited in these sweatshops. So I, and then I, I see the, the FFL has an ad in there. That to me is light years ahead. So I'd like to explore, somebody explore the idea of how do we broaden these different coalitions with some kind of cohesiveness in terms of those of us who are disgusted with the anti-immigration laws and anti-immigration feelings in this country. As a child, I suddenly realized my parents weren't citizens. I probably couldn't have gotten an education. It also didn't deny me the opportunity to defend my country in the world, world War II. So I really think there's a need to go beyond the coalitions you're talking about, the ethnic groupings, but even building beyond that area where we can, I, I'm sure, build those coalitions. And so would you like to just introduce yourself and all the um, people who are going to ask questions or make comments? What? I'm Sam Hirsch. I'm the co-chair of the Labor Religion Coalition in New York City. Would any of our panelists ask that question? And after a brief uh, interpretation of the question. Well, just as, and, as it relates to, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 짧게 하겠습니다. 그 주문화 주문화 무단들이 간지인데요. 그 지금 합법이 오늘 그 자민주 견딜 얘기하면서 너무 합법 이민자들만 얘기한 것 같더라고요. 이러한 그 진짜 희생자인 그 불법 이민자, 설비비자들에 대해서 그 문제를 지적하셨습니다. 그러한 자민주 견딜에서 그런 문제가 어떻게 볼 건지. 그래서 
어, 여기 질문하실 수 있는 분이 있으면 질문, 아, 대답할 수 있는 분이 있으면 대답하게 되겠습니다. Well, I mean, as you all recall, when the legislation came about to, uh, for welfare, so-called welfare reform, um, a, a legislative determination was made to make and recognize distinctions between legal immigrants and so-called illegal immigrants. Um, many of our groups have worked, um, our, our history really has, a, has been about understanding that the differences between legal and undocumented immigrants really are not that great. And I think we're also, many of us, concerned about uh, labor conditions. And that is why um, many of our groups have always argued that rather than deal with sanction, employer sanctions or other measures like that, what we really need to do is to have more funds for labor enforcement so that if minimum wage and hour standards, uh, workplace protections apply to all people, that employers couldn't use immigration status to split, split up uh, differences within the workforce. So I think there's an understanding, certainly among the Asian American and Korean American and other uh, immigrant rights groups, um, that that's an important issue. But in long term, what is the solution? I mean, I think ultimately we ought to be, first of all, uh, where possible to try to mobilize to bring about a legislative change. A long, we have to look at the long term solution because all of these short term fixes for example, restoring SSI benefits to certain legal immigrants, that's not sufficient. And I think if we understand that's not sufficient, then we need to go about thinking longer term about, first of all, for those who are citizens to be sure they register to vote and know exactly how those congressional representatives voted on issues that are of concern to so many poor people as well as immigrants and, and communities of color. Um, and I think we need to continue to educate our own communities, and what, as well as to challenge those reports in the media which have misrepresented uh, views about immigrants. 네, 그, 그, 그러니까 불법 이민자들의 문제에 대해서 어, 전혀 안 다, 그러니까 이런 단체들이나 이런 것들 전혀 안 다루는 건 아니고요. 그 고용, 어, 고용 문제라든지 직장에서의 차별 문제라든지 불법 이민자의 생각하는 문제에 대해서 나름대로 어, 대처를 하고 있습니다. 하지만 그 지금 당장의 문제를 해결하는 것과 아, 장기적으로 어, 문제를 해결하는 것은 아, 분리시켜야 되는데요. 지금 당장의 문제를 해결한다 그래서 초점 맞춘다 그래서 장기적인 문제, 근본적인 문제 해결 안 되는 거기 때문에 그 보다 근본적인 장기적인 해결을 위해서는 어, 그 법적 투쟁이라든지 그 특히 그 시민권자의 초점이 맞춘 그 유권자 등록이라든지 어, 그 시민권 관영 활동이라든지 이제 그런 부분이 굉장히 중요하다는 얘기 있었습니다. Um, if I can add to that, um, um, I completely agree with um, uh, Robert <laughs> uh, on this um, long-term approach uh, to this uh, problem. Uh, if you know, if we can call it a problem, it's really it's unfair, unjust. Um, but I think here what we are uh, facing is really a um, civil rights issues, uh, although they may be undocumented uh, immigrants and they don't have uh, U.S. citizenship. So you, have, you may wonder whether they, co they come under the protection of U.S. Constitution. constitution. But the problem is the, the current um, uh, laws, the so-called immigration reform law, that. Uh, that is so punitive and inhumane to undocumented <coughs> immigrants, essentially take away all of the rights uh, and due processes uh, from these uh, uh, people who work here uh, and who can contrib contribute to the nation nation's economy. And the, the question is whether we can afford, whether they are citizens or not, whether we can afford to have a group of people in this country who, who do not have any rights uh, as a member of society. And uh, we used to have that group of people uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, and they were slaves. Uh, and we know what kind of society we lived in if we had uh, you know, uh, people w without any rights. And in fact, the, uh, the brutal attacks to the, the Haitian immigrants and the enslavement of undocumented Mexican immigrants uh, for forced labor that occurred uh, this year is just direct uh, result of the climate and the condition that was created by this awful, awful laws. And 
Are we willing to live in a society where things like that happen? And would, would that not touch us, our humanity, and our interests, and our ability to hold the society together as a one nation? And so it's, it's really a, a long-term civil rights issues of what kind of society we want to live in, what kind of right we want to give to people who belong to society. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a need to raise the issue of undocumented uh, immigrants to the level of civil rights to make an argument, uh, the case for them, that uh, we cannot live, we cannot afford to have this sort of problem go on. Yes, Mark? Yeah, you know, this, this whole immigration thing is, to me, in terms of the battles that are being waged, we're not getting out to the American people what is actually going on right now. Why do you think the Wall Street Journal uh, and other uh, sectors, even within the Republican Party, believe that the current anti-immigration uh, uh, legislation is misdirected? Because they're the, the, they understand that the nature of the global economy right now is already creating massive uh, movement of labor. There are thousands of Americans who live in Hong Kong. There are thousands that are working as oil workers and, and financial people in Saudi Arabia. There are Americans that are all over the world. Uh, in, I'm not talking small numbers. Long, I, I heard something like 50,000 Americans living in Hong Kong. Uh, the, the, uh, the numbers of Americans that have gone in the maquiladora section of northern Mexico, right? 550,000 Mexicans work in over 2,000 factories right across the Rio Grande River. Why are so many of the factories right there? Because the American factory managers want to live on the U.S. side, and then they commute every morning to manage the factories on the other side, right? And so they all live in the U.S. and work in Mexico. The managers, the factory managers. Uh, so that the problem is the same open borders that American capital wants for its industry, it doesn't want rec reciprocity in terms of open borders for uh, migrant workers. And it, it, it's perfect sense. As a capitalist, why would you want to have a factory in El Paso where you got to pay a, a, a garment workers 8,000 hours, where well, you can move the factory half a mile over uh, into Juarez, and you can pay five hours a day, six dollars a day. Same way as a Mexican, how would you stay on the Juarez side, you know, uh, making six dollars a day? Well, all you got to do is get across that river, uh, uh, which is no wider in most places in this auditorium, right? And uh, and you could make that much an hour or more. So the property. The globalization of, industry, uh, the, of, of uh, uh, exporting of, of, of factories to the third world is pulling people off the land. And then once they get industrial skills and they see what they can do, they say, hey, I'm not going to stay here. I was in San Pedro de Macorí in the Dominican Republic a few years ago, the famous place where all the great ball players come from. And San Pedro de Macorí has an industrial zone out, right outside the city that had 98 factories employed 43,000 uh, Dominicans, most of them women. It's a city of factories. 15 years ago, it didn't exist. In 15 years, they created an industrial park of 98 factories with 43,000 people working in them, all producing stuff for the United States, uh, and most of them women. So this is what's happening. It's, it's, it's happening so quickly. Uh, the shift of industry away from the United States into the third world dislocating the economies of whole countries and, and making many former peasants on the move. They're on the move into shanty towns in the cities, and from the cities they move to England or the United States uh, or France or wherever they can get into, the, in, into these industrial countries. And we've got to explain to the American people that most people don't leave their countries because they want to get into the United States. They're trying to survive. The gap in income is so great now, that the number one source of income in Haiti is the money that Haitians send back to their family members. Number two source of income in the Dominican Republic is the money that Dominicans in this city send back to their people there. Salvador, the same thing. All these countries are surviving from the money that those members of their families who can get to the United States send back home. So that uh, unless you change the gap, 
unless you increase the living standards in the third world, the immigration is going to continue. People have no choice but to figure, figure out a way to survive. The Huan Shiga Yaka Munjede, so the Iran, the Pulpo Bibi Munjere, Sege, 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 경제적인 문제와 연관시켜서 얘기하겠습니다. 아까 발제수도 잠깐 얘기하셨기 때문에 길게 말씀 안 드리겠습니다. 어, 그리고요, 아까 통행을 못 했는데요. 어, 정민, 어, 낙가석 이사님께서 어, 한국말도 하실 줄 아시니까 직접 얘기를 해주시면 간단히 얘기해 주시면 좋겠습니다. 간단하게 얘기하자면 이 불법 이민 문제에 대해서 이, 어, 지금 이 장기적인 그런 전략이 필요하다고 그러는데요. 어, 이제 그것이 그 우리가 생각해야 할 것이 그걸 단순히 그 불법 체류자니까 법을 어긴 사람들이고 미국의 법을 보호받을 수 없다는 사람은 그런 차원보다는 어, 우리 미국 이 사회에서 한 구성원이고 그들도 권리가 있고 만약 그들에게 아무런 권리를 주지 않을 경우 어, 미국의 그런 그룹이 아무런 권리가 없는 그룹이 생길 경우 어, 미국 사회에 엄청난 권리가 생긴다는 것 그거를 미국 주류 사회에도 우리 주변에 다 알표가 있다는 거죠 그러니까 그런 적이 있었죠 미국에 아무런 권리가 없는 그런 그룹이 있었던 시절이 있죠. 그게 이제 흑인 노예들이었죠. 근데 그런 사회에 우리가 살고 싶냐. 그걸 우리는 어, 미국 어, 이 정치 세력과 주류 사회에 물어봐야 할 것이고 그래서 이런 불법 체류자의 문제를 단순히 어떤 이민의 문제가 아니라 어, 지금 현 시대에 가장 중요한 어, 이 시, 인권 문제 중에 하나로 어, 부각시켜서 어, 이 문제를 풀어나갈 것이다. In case you're wondering, that was a translation of his earlier answer before in English. With uh, one uh, talk sandwiched in between. But thank you very much for your answers. I think, um, I hope that was helpful to Sam and also others. Can you introduce yourself and ask Oh, I'm David O, and uh, I'm a college student. I just wanted to ask, Tejshaw mentioned before how there was a correlation between uh, uh, strong test performance and uh, well, good performance in school along with income. And I was wondering why affirmative action doesn't focus on income instead of race. Some of the opponents, I appreciate your question, some of, your, uh, uh, some of the opponents of affirmative action say that we should replace race-based affirmative action with class-based affirmative action that is income, and I assume that's the question that you're asking. Okay. Uh, the problem with that is that most poor people in, in this country, in absolute numbers, are white. While African Americans and Latino Americans tend to be disproportionately poor, most poor people in this country, in absolute numbers, are, are white. So if we were to say, let's only have class-based affirmative action, there's no guarantee that we would end up with racial or ethnic diversity. Now, my own belief is that middle class and working class white people, certainly poor white people, uh, but particularly poor white people, end up getting the short end of the stick in the educational process also. Uh, because high-stakes institutions don't go after them in a way I think fairness would dictate that they should. But what happens is that those folks in particular, to the extent that they do apply to high-stakes institutions and are not admitted, or are admitted and see scholarships that are available uh, which are targeted at people of color, by the way, those scholarships are under attack and being knocked out in some places. Uh, they then resent people of color, and particularly African Americans. And they buy into the proposition that all of the denials of opportunity that they experience are because African Americans or Latinos in particular are getting those opportunities. Uh, and the numbers and the facts simply don't bear that out. So it's very divisive ground. Uh, but the bottom line answer to your question is that class-based affirmative action doesn't work or will not work to remedy race-based discrimination because uh, there has to be some kind of parity between the, the, the problem and the remedy. 
In other words, in order to remedy racial discrimination, we have to be conscious of race. It's not race consciousness that is evil. It's white supremacy or it's race exclusion that is evil. But the people who are attacking affirmative action say that we ought to be colorblind. What they really mean is that, or the effect of what they're saying, if they don't mean it, is that we will be blind to race for all purposes and therefore we won't be able to solve the problem of race. Affirmative action, the Sosoke, the Potato, the Cosso, the Indian, the Indian, the 돈을 많이 까 인컴을 기준으로 하는 것에 어떻게 생각하냐고 물어봐 주민이 나왔으면서 지금 테드 씨께서 어그 지금 현재 인종 문제가 남아 있는 이상 그그 그 인컴을 기준으로 해서 어플리 액션 어 적용을 한다면은 그 인종 문제가 해결이 안 되기 때문에 지금 그 그거는 지금 곤란하다고 얘기했습니다. <laughs> you can also ask questions in the Korean language. 한국말로 질문을 하셔도 됩니다. 안녕하세요. 제 이름은 지성이고요. 우리 부모님들이 어촌 면에서 강의를 하고 계세요. 근데 거기서 일해본 경험이랑 어 체처 분이 얘기하신 경험, 어 이렇게 음 아프리카 아메리칸들과 크리에이션 레이션이 관심이 많아요. 음. And my question is um, directed towards Mr. Shaw. And the question is, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to repeat what I say in English. Um, as a Korean and having parents um, own a grocery store in um, in Baltimore, Maryland, which is um, which is the situation that you've talked about, um, my concern is is that mm, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. My question is. You suggested earlier that we needed to work on the relations amongst the Koreans and the, and the blacks. And with, and, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, how are we at this point equipped to deal with that issue? Because having, um, having been a Korean and having Korean parents working in those stressful conditions and understanding the other line as well um, of the other society and what they go through, are we at this point equipped to deal with those two issues? Because I understand that my parents can be stubborn as well as the other. So are we equipped to deal with that? Uh, I, I think we are. If we find ways to get past the barriers that uh, are evident between us, whether those barriers are language or other cultural manifestations, very often people uh, simply don't get to the point where, where they see the other person as first a human being who has at bottom the same kinds of dreams and aspirations uh, as, as they do. Uh, those of us who have been fortunate enough to travel uh, around the world to other places, I think one of the most important lessons we learn is that whatever the outward manifestations of difference are, are, are that people all over the world basically are the same. Um, that the differences that divide us are uh, more superficial than we sometimes let them be. I think the issue is whether we find the mechanisms, the flora, the places where we can uh, get past those barriers. And that might mean organizations that specifically promote dialogue between uh, Korean Americans and African Americans, but it also may mean uh, if those organizations don't exist and we don't start them, just attempts by individuals to have dialogue with other people. And language and culture certainly makes that more difficult, but not impossible. Uh, we simply cannot stop and say these differences are too great to overcome uh, because the alternative is unacceptable. 네, 그, 어, 그 테드 셔 씨의 것 다시 질문하셨는데요. 그 한음 가지기 잠깐 질문이 있었습니다. 그 어머니, 부모님께서, 어, 어, 그 가게를, 그, 그, 이 민민가에서 가게를 운영하고 계신데, 그 아까 물론 테드 셔 씨가 말한 그런 
서로를 이해해야 되고 어, 그런 걸 알지만 그런 어, 부모님 지켜보면서 그런 현실 속에서 어, 그, 그런 걸 과연 할수 있는지 그러니까 서로 어떤 그, 이해하고 연대할 수 있는 게 가능한지에 대해서 물어봤습니다. 그래서 테드 셔 씨가 대답하기를 어, 그, 그 가능하다고 이제 중요한 거는 어, 그런 가능한 어떻게 하면 그것이 가능한지 그러한 그 구조를 만들어내는 것이 중요하다고 얘기했습니다. 그래서 어, 그, 그런 단일적 연대나 단, 저, 단, 어, 조직이 없다면 조직을 만들어야 될 것이고 아니면 개인이라고 해야 될 것이고 물론 문화나 언어라든지 이런 여러 가지 어려움이 있지만 그것도 극복 못할 문제는 아니고 어, 우리가 어떻게 그러한 그 연대의 구조를 만들어 나갈 것이 중요하다고 얘기했습니다. Can I just, I, you know, I'm not satisfied with my answer. I just want to say something very quickly. And it's, it's this. If we are going to, if, if, for example, we have Korean-owned stores in African-American communities, and we, uh, uh, we find ways to do business together, no matter how uneasy the relationship is, at some level or another, there's some kind of communication going on. There's some kind of interaction going on. We are interacting already. The question is whether we are going to find a way to make our interactions count to build bridges. And that's a question of effort and commitment. Uh, but we're going to be interacting. We already are. And I'm saying that the alternative uh, is, doesn't work well. So we can find a way. Uh, we may not be well equipped, but we have to get to be better equipped to do it. Yeah, I'd like to add a couple of things about this, because I think that the, first of all, um, back in, 19, in, in the early 1980s, I was a reporter at the Philadelphia Daily News. And at that time, a large number of Korean businesses were developing in the African-American community along Germantown Avenue, North Philadelphia, and West Philly. And, that, uh, and I can see as a reporter that a lot of conflict was, was uh, beginning to arise then. I'm talking about 1980, uh, 81. So I decided I was going to do my own investigation and, uh, and uh, attempt to write a series of articles about the development of the Korean community in, uh, in Philadelphia. One of the things that I began to conclude, and, and I think we often mistake form for essence in uh, social phenomena, you know, like uh, the Irish and the, and the English have been fighting and everybody's always called it a religious war. No, it, the religion is the, fo the form it took. The essence was a colonial domination of a people by an imperial power. Uh, uh, this issue in America, uh, see, because before the, 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 the boogeyman that arose in a, in a lot of African American communities of the Korean businessmen in the 60s, most of the stores in the inner city, a, a lot of them, especially in the major urban areas, were, were Jewish owned. The, the riots of the 1960s, especially in 19, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, where one week there were riots in 125 cities in the United States. Not one, like in LA. There was 125 cities in the United States that rioted. Drove most of the, the small business community out of a lot of the inner city areas. What had happened then, beginning in the 70s and 80s, because there was still a, a business climate, someone had to fill the gap. The reality is that a lot of times what happens is, for instance, in our own Puerto Rican community in the 19, early 1960s, most of the businesses started being bought up by Cubans who began immigrating, and a big conflict arose between Puerto Ricans and Cubans. Why are the Cubans owning all the jewelry stores and all the grocery stores in our communities? And, and, and the Puerto Ricans felt that the Cubans treated them in an arrogant manner. There was, it was not a, a, a national conflict. It was a, it was a class conflict that developed. Most of the Cubans were declassed. They had come from a very high class. They had suddenly been reduced to having to be small businessmen, and they resented it, right? And, 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 uh, and so you had basically a class conflict which was masking itself as a cultural conflict between Puerto Ricans and Cubans. Most of the bodegas to this day in New York City right now are owned by Dominicans. They used to be owned by Puerto Ricans. However, there is not the same kind of conflict that has developed between Puerto Ricans and Dominicans as there were in the 60s between Puerto Ricans and Cubans. Because the, both immigrant groups arise, came out of the same poorer classes. So the, 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 the Puerto Rican bodega owners, they sold their bodegas, they moved back to Puerto Rico, their kids went to college, and now all the Puerto Ricans who are professionals in New York City, a lot of them are, are 
sons and daughters of the Puerto Rican bodega owners of the 1950s. Uh, and so that you got to look at the class uh, nature of some of these conflicts. What I found in the early Korean businessmen that, uh, in North Philadelphia, that many of them were from middle class, but they were engineers. Uh, uh, there, were ed there was an educated immigration process that came, so that some of it may have, uh, may have been a class conflict as well as a, a cultural conflict that was, a, was, uh, was developing. So I think we've got to analyze these, the, I, I go back to the particularities of the migration experiences. Uh, some migrations are of poor people, others are of middle class and upper class people who are fleeing for one political reason or another, and the way they express themselves in the new country and how they progress has a lot to do with who they were, who their families were, and where they came from in the original country. You can't separate the migration here from, from the, their, their experiences back home.
So there were several Korean young men, uh, youth, who died, who gave their life to pr protect those stores. And uh, one of them uh, is a cousin of mine, cousin, a friend of mine. They were actually in poverty. So this you know, poor young, uh, young kid with uh, promises, uh, who was trying to do good things and you know, uh, protect the honor of Korean community, whatever, was misled uh, by this um, you know, fringe of you know, Korean ethnocentrism, for lack of a better word, to protect someone who's much richer, who didn't want to hire a security guard because he wants to save money. And you know, is this justice? I mean, is this the type of things that uh, want Korean uh, community uh, to become? So we really need to think about the realities of, and you know, some of that should involve our self-criticism and self-evaluation of where our community came from, where we are. I think you know, we may not be, ch be able to change every one of uh, our, I guess, my parents' generation and your parents' generation. Um, maybe you know, we can try. But I think what's important is that we don't carry this problem, this division, uh, into the next generation. And there's real danger, problem of that happening. And that uh, we really have to start working so that uh, we go beyond this uh, problem of seeing things superficially and really see what the problem is. <coughs> そういう한일관계라는문제에대해서인테그인종문제나민족문제의편견들을많이생각을하는데어진짜이제바야한거는그안에있는사회적인구조의문제고개국의문제고가진자와가지않은자의문제이런것을봐야한다는것이죠그러
Great. Did any other panelists have um, anything to add to that question? Yeah. 